All right. Hi, I'm Martin. I'm a PhD student from the University of Edinburgh, currently an intern at Google, and right, I'm talking about driving MLI compilation from Python. So let's first set the scene a little bit, like whom is this actually for? All right, so you're, you're all compiler engineers in some way. So this is for like, so suppose you're an ML researcher and you have like a new model with like a custom op, it performs badly, of course, because it's a new op, um, but you might have an idea on like how to tile it to your, to your hardware. Right, of maybe a performance engineer, and you have an idea, of, like you want to prototype an optimization recipe for your for your model, or maybe you are just a compiler engineer and are trying to figure out, like I want to have this one transform fire, but I can't figure out which which sequence of passes do I need to run. Um, right, and a, and the flow that all of these people might share is this, right? So you you expose uh, express your computation like ML or general purpose in JAX, lower through MLIR, LVM, and then go to GPU. All right. So let's look at an example of what, what this might look like. So we have a batch map more here expressed in JAX. It's pretty straightforward. It's just uh, jax.batch map more. All right. And then we go to L uh, MLIR. We are convert to stable HO, convert to Linux. And uh, it's easy enough. We have the, just the Linux batch map more, like a fill to the output. It's pretty straightforward. But the magic is actually, right, like how do we, how do we optimize that? So how it works, like conceptually, is like you have this, this linear representation, like five lines of code. You optimize it somehow with op like some, some recipe, right? This might be C++ or transform dialect or whatever. And then you have like still an MLIR, like a lower level representation, and then convert to LVM uh, IR and execute. Sounds easy enough, as someone just kind of hands you this optimization recipe for your specific computation for your specific hardware. But in practice, it's, it's, it's not always as easy, right? So, because this recipe, so in this particular example, we're using transform dialect. If you don't know what that is, there's an uh, amazing tutorial from last year. But essentially, you're using IR, like an MLIR dialect, to express uh, how you chain transformations to optimize something, right? And yeah, it's still like, this is like very verbose. It's for a very simple thing, right? It's just a batch map more, but it's still 200 lines of code. Um, and it's IR, right? It's not something you want to hand write. You want to generate this somehow. And even if you like, if you're an expert user and you can handwrite this, it's very tedious and, and error prone, right? Like if you mix up two instructions, the whole thing might just not compile anymore or yield to bad performance. So for the use cases, I, I like we said, it's uh, it's like way too low of an abstraction to be actually be be useful for these people, right? So what what do we, did we do in this project? So you have your still your JAX computation, right? Batch map more. On the right hand side, you see the Linux thing. This is lower two. And next to your JAX computation, you write now a schedule. And in the schedule, right, it's like layered on top of the transform dialect. You can say, like, you get handled to your module, and you can say, match my batch map mode, match my fill up, and then tile my batch map mode to a for all, fuse my fill into that, and then tile the map mode again. All right, so, and then, to, like, regarding certain tile sizes. And then you jit the whole thing at the end and execute. All right, so how does this work? The schedule actually generates the transform IR. We, uh, we saw before, like it generates the, the optimization recipe, right? So it kind of gives the user um, an interface to, to, yeah, to define the schedule for this. And what we do is we inject the schedule, like this MLIR, next to the, next to the payload, next to, next to the computation, apply the transform uh, script, and get the, the optimized IR. Okay, um, that sounds easy enough, like the, but the, the whole thing that, that we generate is still like this big. So is, the question is like, is all of this actually interesting? So if we zoom in a bit, there is, there is actually interesting stuff here, right? It's like tiled for all, and we see this, that's, that's very nice. But there's a whole lot of other stuff as well, right? So what is there actually? There's like canonicalization, folding, tiling canonicalization, all of that stuff. So and this is like actually required for the schedule to work. It doesn't work without this. Um, without these things. So these are, I think of these as kind of enabling transforms. They are required to, to enable the bigger, like higher level conceptually transforms like tiling. So, but if we look at the whole schedule, like almost 65% of this is enablers. And you kind of currently kind of have to kind of guess where do you have to, where do you have to inject which enablers? Um, but there is actually structure to this. So if you, if you analyze this, there's only four different types of enablers here. Right, so we thought let's, let's, let's try to capture this structure a little bit. So, um, <clears throat> we, we, let's look at an example. Mm. We just have a for loop here, and inside the inner for loop, we, we, lo we, um, we load from a memref. Right, and you see, like, if we, um, if we would interchange these two loops, we might increase locality on, on some hardware. Right, and a performance engineer looks at this and thinks, like, all right, like, what do you have to do for this specific bit of IR? 
to enable this interchange because here this interchange is not possible because there is something in between the loops, right? It's not legal. So you think about it, how, how do I do this for this specific bit of IR? And you say, all right, like I have to do a loop invariant code motion, hoist the thing out, and then it's interchangeable. All right, all right, I'm happy. But the thing is, you have to do this for every example, right? For every optimization, for every piece of IR that you're interested in, you have to do this, right? And that's not what we want, right? Let's, so let's take a step back. And for the interchange thing, think about like, what is, what do we actually expect in the IR? Like what kind of structure, right? And for the interchange is actually, we expect our loops to be perfectly nested, right? So we can interchange them. There shouldn't be anything in between them. And then we can think about what kind of transforms, like what canonicalizations do we need to, to express that? So this is kind of the enabler category here. So a bunch of like random, it's not really important, but it's like a bunch of stuff that you do and that should kind of put all the IRs that, that all the payloads that could become a perfectly nested for loop should put them into that structure, right? All right, and I'm not actually calling them enabler categories. I'm borrowing like a word from the, from the term rewriting community, which is normal forms. So what I define here is the perfect for nest form. So this gives me now a way to kind of, um, to, ex to, to say what kind of structure do I expect in the IR for my transform to, to fire. All right. Okay, so instead of doing just like the LLCM for this specific, spe specific bit of IR, I can do the normalized, this should work in more cases, and then do the interchange, and this should work. Right, and we can push this even further, right? So I've told you about the perfect for nest form, but we might define something like the for all plus for nest form. So if a nest of four and four odds, or for all, four for all and wires, or, or whatever, right? And the weakest form of a normal form is the any form. So any IR can be considered to be in this form. Right, but you can also like define more forms if you like, like the memref no alias form or something. And so interesting fact is MLIR actually doesn't have a canonical form, right? They are canonicalizers, but there's no canonical form. And I think that totally makes sense because MLA has left like multiple abstraction levels, right? There shouldn't be a canonical form. There should be multiple normal forms or like my <laughs> multiple can canonical forms or something, right? Um, and not only one for each dialect, but for like here for the, for the SAF dialect, we have multiple already and it makes sense. All right, so let's look at a small example. So we have our interchange um, transform here defined and we define like as precondition, we need the perfect for nest form. And if you think about it, the, the interchange just interchanges two loops, right? It doesn't destroy this form, this structure in the IR. So our post condition is also perfect for nest form. So if you look at an example, we have a module of, um, of two for nests. Um, we start with a handle to our module, and then we match the outer for loop, the inner for loop, and the memory inside. And we see like we, don't, we know nothing about these handles, right? So they're all in like the weakest normal form. And then we do the interchange. And the, we know for the interchange, it requires a specific normal form. So what we do is we automatically inject the, the normalization to perfect for nest form. So these handles in the, are in that form, right? Then we actually do the interchange and then we continue. We match the second for loop, the inner one and the, the Linux generic, and we want to tile this, right? And the tiling also requires the perfect for nest form. So again, we normalize Right, and this is a, so you see this is tiled to for all up, right? So we, in, we introduce the for all up into this thing. So afterwards, it's not in the perfect for nest form anymore, it's in the for all plus for nest form. And you realize the module also, like this was propagated outwards to the module as well, um, because it also contains now a for all, but not to the parallel loop nest. All right, and like an easy optimization you might do is, you know, like maybe you know I have a module of like perfect for nests, where I want to do something, I can just normalize the whole module, right? So you do module normalize, then you don't need the normalization anymore because we track this through this handle system, we track the normal form they are in statically, right? Okay, so you don't need to do the normalization anymore, so you even like save passes over the IR. All right, so the gist of this is like, not every user has to think about this, this like how, how do I enable this transform? But the designer of a transform thinks once about what is the structure I actually expect of the IR, expresses it in the system, and the user can just, just use these normal forms. All right, and kind of this abstraction that we have also very naturally enables auto-tuning, right? So we have like the matmol tile, matmol tile here, once with an outer tile size and an inner tile size, and all of this is parametric, right? And we can even, uh, can even express uh, constraints. So like the, the outer tile is like in one, two, four, eight, and the inner tile should divide the outer tile Right, so you could ship like a, a parametric, like you can auto tune this thing very easily, but you can also ship this to a users and if, like tune on the user device. Um, or maybe like you have, a, you have a company 
where your model, your internal model is secret, um, but you still want to collaborate on the schedule somehow, right? You can just kind of put, uh, take all the secret stuff out, leave it uh, parametric, and then still, still collaborate. Right, but even better, right? Like the normal forms, so think about it. Um, the normal forms enable you to much more naturally express um, how you actually want to schedule your thing. And it doesn't only enable you to do that, also an auto tuner has now much, much, like an auto scheduler has now much easier time generating valid schedules, right? It's actually very, very difficult to generate schedules, not only that kind of optimize like well, but I have the, the enablers at the right places and like lifting this burden from the auto tuner makes it much more easy. Um, yes, and uh, that kind of enables auto tuning beyond like only the built-in stuff. Um, you, you can just bring your, your own transforms, your own normal, uh, normal forms um, and get auto scheduling. Right, so the huge giant schedule is actually done in our system, just this. It's like still quite complicated, but actually much, much easier. Um, right, so you have like uh, tiling, vectorization, we lower and uh, do some uh, GPU specific transforms and the end, at the end we lower to LVM. Right, but you're saying, all right, this talk was like driving the compiler from Python, right? This is like, just, why isn't it called scheduling in MLIR or something? Well, actually, um, it is driving the whole compiler from Python because this lower to LVM is just module convert Linux to loops pass, convert SCF to CF pass, right? So we can do the transforms on different granularity levels, right? It can be a single transform, but it can also be a whole pass, right? So we actually completely drive the compiler from here, from this, from this schedule representation. All right, I'll skip over this because I'm out of time. And, and with the contributions, heads off to, to my collaborators. Uh, I, had, I had a very good time working on this. Um, yes, I'm looking forward to, to your questions. As usual, microphones in the center. If you have any questions, come on up. How does this compare to the module keynote? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, the concepts are quite similar. Um, I mean, right, so modular is like an, a front end for MLIR, right? And um, in a certain sense, this, this also tries, so modular is like an abstraction on top of MLIR trying to give the user some control, like uh, you can define your library with like index dialect and whatever. And this is like, uh, it feels to me like a similar approach to, to solving like a quite similar problem. Um, so giving, giving control into the hands of the user. How do you define the normal forms? Right, you, so the normal form is defined uh, through the transforms to get to this normal form, right? So the perfect form is form, it's statically, right? So I don't know what the payload will be, but someone thinks about this, like which, which transformations do I need to apply to, to get to this normal form, right? So it might just be that you have a program which is based on loops and you apply the perfect form is form, but you don't have perfectly nested for loops because my, you, maybe you have, just have stuff that's not hoistable, right? But it's like in, in yeah. What happens if it's not possible to apply the transform to, to the normal form? Right, then the transform just fails, but it can fail gracefully. Mm -hmm. So you can do stuff like try to interchange these loops and if it's not possible, do something else, right? So an auto scheduler, for example, might benefit from that as well, right? You can try to like try, try to parallelize or try to, I don't know, try to tile. Maybe that's not possible um, with your payload, so try something else. Thank you. We've got time for one or two more questions. Going once, going twice. All right, thank you for your questions. Yep, let's give another hand.